Okay, I think we're ready to get started. Uh, we've got critical mass here. Hi, everybody. My name is Skip Sanzeri. I am the co-founder uh, and chief operating officer at QSecure. We are working on post-quantum cybersecurity. Um, we have a wonderful group today that uh, we're going to talk about the quantum threat um, and how it can threaten devices. Um, and we will have solutions uh, to show you as well. Um, and many of you probably are aware that quantum computing has been in the news even more lately. Um, the threats seem to be getting worse out there. And I think the message is they're probably closer than a lot of us think. Um, and from some of our folks who have clearances, um, we're hearing that you know, the, the movement is, is significant. Um, and so our lineup today, maybe we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, we've got some wonderful speakers here for you uh, today. John Kindervog has joined us as a guest today. Uh, he is the creator of Zero Trust. Uh, this is a term that many of you have heard out there. John has been instrumental globally in, in being able to discuss this and in, in position Zero Trust. Uh, Rebecca Crothamer, co-founder at QSecure and chief product officer is going to be on as well. Aaron Moore. One of the key advisors to QSecure is going to discuss some of the issues with SCADA devices and others. Greg Buller, the CTO uh, at QSecure, will be on as well. He also heads up engineering, so we'll move into some of the solutions. So we are here to discuss this quantum threat. Um, and I think you'll find that in, in looking at how quantum computers work and what they're capable of, that um, there, uh, there is a lot of movement that is not um, easily identifiable out there where they're combining ways to use quantum now where it's not just about getting to 4,099 qubits, uh, but there are other ways using classical systems in combination, uh, even stringing uh, with entanglement quantum computers together. So uh, we'll get into some depth on that now. So why don't we uh, move to the next slide and I'd like to hand over to John. John, please take it away. Hey, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is John Kindervog. I, uh, I'm friends with the folks at QSecure, and they asked me to come in and talk about this and put it a little bit in the context of what I'm doing uh, with Zero Trust. I am the creator of Zero Trust. I created it when I was at Forrester Research, wrote the first paper in 2010. If you're not familiar with it, a lot of information, but the President of the United States last year uh, issued an executive order mandating all federal government agencies adopt zero trust. I was on a CISA um, uh, subcommittee through NSTAC on zero trust, been doing a lot of work on this. But also when I was at Forrester Research, I was the encryption guy. I wrote about encryption. I covered the, the space. So I'm excited to talk to you about uh, what, we're, what, what is happening in the world of post-quantum uh, because for the first time in the history of cybersecurity, and hey, let's face it, cybersecurity hasn't been around that long. I was around when we called it information security. So cybersecurity is even newer than that. But for the first time in, in the history of it, we're getting ahead of the threat instead of responding to the threat. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what the problem is. Next slide, please. So we've got all, all of the these devices out there. This internet thing is uh, really big. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's all over the world. And I, I have a friend who was involved in registering the very first set of domains. And back then the internet was so small, they did it in a notebook by hand, by writing down the domains. Uh, and so, you know, within my lifetime, I've seen this expand and I'm old, but I'm not that old, right? And, and now we're on the cusp of something really new. And if you look at all of the, the devices that we have out there, um, they use various types of crypto. And I, I've always felt encryption was tremendously valuable. I wrote a report called Kill Your Data, which was about obfuscating it through data through uh masking and, and tokenization and especially encryption because encrypted data in the absence of its key material is generally not data at all it's gobbledygook but what's happening with uh the world of data theft and what what the threat is in in the, in a post-quantum world is that our adversaries are stealing data 
And we have all this kind of data, PII, we talk about trade secrets, national secrets. I have the four Ps, I call them PCI, PII, PHI, which is health information, and then IP. Those are the data that people want to steal. So there's two types of data, data that people want to steal and everything else. What's happening in, is our adversaries are preparing for this post-quantum world by stealing data that they know they can't decrypt today, but they're going to decrypt it in the future. And what's going to happen, right, uh, is that there are there are all kinds of threats to the financial services industry, to critical infrastructure, to national security. I talk about how we have to win the cyber war that we're in using zero trust. Um, there's a two-star general who's a friend of mine uh, and, and uh, he was a special forces guy. And one day, a, a number of years ago, we both worked together at Palo Alto Networks at the time and he said to me john i've already fought my wars you go out and fight your war and so since 2010 cyber war has been a domain of warfare according to the u.s government right so we have air sea land space and cyber those are the five domains of warfare and what is changing is the battlefield uh you know if you think about how warfare has typically been been talked about uh we, we we talk about everybody fights the last war well for the first time we're realizing that um maxim invented the machine gun and we're going to prepare for it before world war one instead of after world war one is over and we've seen the devastation of it so that's what's exciting to be talking to you about today and, and there's people who know a lot more about about quantum computing and quantum encryption than me but uh, and there, a lot of them are on the call. So uh, next slide. Let's talk about uh, what's, what's going to happen. You know, why we're doing this now. Uh, so quantum computers exist. We all know that. Traditionally, we've thought, well, that they, they, aren't, they aren't evolved enough to really be a problem. But that's not true. Um, if we look at the data, it, as I've already mentioned, it's already being stolen. So uh, our adversaries have data that they're going to decrypt because the secrets that are contained within there have a longer lifespan than the encryption technology used to protect it. Um, current cryptography is, is breaking down. It's not going to maintain its state the way we thought it was. I thought this was much farther out than it is. Um, I remember sitting down and having lunch with Whit Diffie, the, one of the key inventors of public key cryptography. And we talked a lot about what are the problems. And his view was, well, encryption, the algorithmic part of it is solved. The key management is the problem. And I re remember that aligned with some research I was doing at Forrester. But now we're seeing that, that the quantum world is moving faster than we thought it was. Uh, than we thought it was going to. And so if we think about something just like the, you know, the keys that we have, because key management is the critical subsystem of cryptography. Uh, you can have great cryptography and poor key management and your toast. I think that's the actual technical term for it. But um, when you think about how we generated keys, it was done by what's called a pseudo random number generator and the pseudo part is the important thing here they were they the 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 pseudo means it's it's kind of fake and so uh they were they were done by computer algorithms trying to get as close to randomness as we can but in the world of quantum you can have full randomness and so uh we we have to we have to realize that that the key man, you know, they're going to be able to to break those keys, um, and so we we have to come up with some new types of of ways to think about the crypto that we're using. And people are working on uh, quantum resistant encryption models, but we're going to have to have better key management and better attack management against uh, that quantum threat. And then, uh, you know. 
uh, we spend a lot of time, I spend a lot of time in Zero Trust talking about critical infrastructure. So critical infrastructure, uh, here we're talking about the power grid, uh, but there's all kinds of critical infrastructure, infrastructure that things don't work well uh, in life if we don't have. If we don't have lights, power generation, uh, if we don't have, uh, if, if we can't get, you know, uh, oil and natural gas delivered. If you know, there's a lot of systems that are critical, including supply chain of the technology we use, that's critical infrastructure. But I live in Dallas, Texas, and if you watch the news a couple of years ago, we we had our power grid completely collapse. Uh, it was the coldest winter in, in the recorded history of Texas. We typically don't have winter the way they do in other places, and it was miserable. I was out of power for hours and hours and hours at a time. Uh, pipes froze. Things got flooded. It was a mess. That was a natural disaster. But that same disaster can be created by the attackers. I myself designed a zero trust environment once for uh, smart meters. And smart meters actually are pretty dumb. You can't protect smart meters. And what we ended up doing was building a system that protected the, the, the power grid from the smart meters that we thought eventually might attack it. So there's all kinds of ways to attack these things, and we need better defenses around that. And as, we, as all of these IoT devices that we talk about, smartphones, 5G, uh you know all these things exist it's hard to validate what those devices are 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 they safe how how do they work are are they properly encrypted these these are really big problems and and, and so the fact that we're starting to have this conversation get ahead of it is really uh important and then um the threat is evolving much quicker than than i thought it would I thought that, you know, even as as uh, early ago as maybe three years, I thought, yeah, and this is 20 years out. I mean, that's what I was getting when I was talking to cryptographers and and people in the Defense Department and other things. This is 20 years out. And then there have been these momentous leaps in technology that no one expected. And suddenly holy moly, we got to get our hands around this now. And so in, in cybersecurity, uh, things happen much faster than even Moore's law predicted. And so if you, you know, the, way, the way the attackers work is they aren't encumbered by the same things that we are. They aren't encumbered by bu budget constraints. They aren't encumbered by manual processes. Um, they don't have change management, right? Hackers don't have change management. Ponder that for a while today. And so uh, I often talk about, you know, we need to build a machine to defeat, defeat a machine. That was a quote from the movie The Imitation Game about Alan Turing building the, the Bomba, the, the analog computer that broke the Enigma machine. And if you remember in that movie, if you've seen it, the, the the other people at Bletchley Park were opposed to the machine and they wanted more of the three P's of crypto analysis of the day, paper, pencils, and people. And we're kind of in that moment right now on whether or not we're going to build the machine or we're going to keep using papers and pencils and people and do this manual. And because this threat has evolved so quickly, we're going to need to solve we're going to need to solve this in a new way and we're going to need to get ahead of it much more quickly than we than, than than we uh than we have and so we need to automate this more and more we need to have um communication channels that are self-monitoring and we're going to need more attack intelligence and we're going to need uh ways to be adaptive in real time we're going to have to leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence and all these buzzwords that feel buzzy, but are really progressing along really, really quickly. I would encourage uh, everybody to um, uh, watch the documentary about Google's um, 
artificial intelligent engine beating the best go players uh go is a is a oriental game kind of like chess that was considered to be so complex that it was going to be 20 or 30 years before you could build a computer uh that was fast enough to process uh the complexity to beat the best go players in the world and they did they did it in a couple of years so all this stuff is advancing much more quickly than we we uh think about it and so on this slide you'll see a quote um about the threats from the Hudson Institute, uh, where they estimate that a single quantum attack shutting down the entire grid could cost up to $12 trillion. Now, is that hype? Maybe a little bit, but the world functions differently than it used to. And we're, we expect to have electricity and, and you know, m my great, great grandparents lived in an era without electricity. Uh, we can't survive without it. So the survival of, of our nation, the survival of our cities, the survival of our families may very well be dependent upon this. And so I'm excited here about what we're doing, what we're talking about today. And um, I'm glad that you've joined and I hope that you get a lot out of this webinar and, and that you have questions and, and that you get information to take back to your organizations so that you can prepare for this next war that we're just about getting ready to fight. Thank you very much. John, thank you so much. Uh, so well articulated. Uh, and yes, this threat is increasing. Um, you know, you talked about uh, Go and how they, they uh, built a machine that could beat the best Go players, a very complex game. Um, these things surprise everybody. And what we don't know is how those sorts of systems combined with quantum, uh, how and what they'll do, you're absolutely right. Quantum is exponential in nature. Um, that it's it's defined by that um, the exponent. So, you know the the uh, the comparison is if you look at a standard computer like we use now, classical computers. If I have fifty of those, I add one more, I have fifty one. But in the quantum world, with qubits, you add one more qubit, you double the power. So it's two to the fifty first, two to the fifty second, two to the fifty third. Those numbers add up really really quickly give you just a, a couple ideas, two to the 300th, which would be a 300 qubit computer would have uh, more elements in it than there are atoms in the entire universe. Just one computer, two to the 300th. So anyway, it, it's pretty wild. Another thing I wanna tell everybody, um, there is Q and A box at the bottom and should be in your Zoom, uh, in your Zoom screen there. Uh, we're gonna answer questions at the end. Um, I would suggest please post your questions anytime uh, during the webinar and we'll get to those. And then um, if it's running towards the end and we're over, if you'd like us to answer them offline, if you include your email address, uh, we'll do that as well. Next up, Rebecca Crothamer, uh, Chief Product Officer and Head of Marketing for QSecure. Go ahead, Becca. Thanks, Skip. Thanks, John. Uh, and I'm gonna take it a step back and talk about that threat. What, what makes quantum computing so powerful? So when it comes to quantum computing, there is probably no technology that is more overhyped and underestimated. And what, what makes the potential of quantum so powerful? Uh, next slide, Pat. Most people have heard the explanation that quantum computers use qubits, and these qubits can be in the state of one, zero, or one and zero at the same time, right? But for a lot of people, that's not super satisfying. What does that actually translate to? Um, maybe you remember a few years back when Warren Buffett offered a billion dollars to anyone who could come up with a perfect March Madness bracket. And at first you look at that and that sounds crazy, right? Like how could he take that big of a risk offering that much money? And then you do the math and you realize he could take that risk because it's not a risk. There's only a one in nine quintillion chance of anyone choosing perfectly, which is just not going to happen. And this, this type of problem where you start off with a smallish number of variables and you end up with an uncountable number of combinations is called combinatorial explosion. And it underlies why certain problems are impossible to solve with classical computers in things like financial optimization, stock portfolio optimization, logistics, AI, and even drug discovery. Next slide, Pat. There are billions and billions of dollars being poured into this field from both private institutions and governments because it will be such a powerful, powerful tool. And like most powerful tools, as we heard already, uh, it can be used for both good and bad. And that's the reason we're all here today. 
at just about 4,000 qubits, quantum computing will totally annihilate public key cryptography. And now, of course, the question arises, where are we today with quantum computing and why do I care now? Uh, and though we are in the early days of quantum computers, it is still imperative to get ahead of it because, and as John really, uh, really beautifully explained, there's this idea of store now decrypt later attacks, which is largely a nation state attack. Next slide, Pat. And so this really immediate risk uh, is exactly the reason there's been a push on both the development side as well as on the regulation side. Um, so back in 2019, first the DOD announced plans for hardening cryptography against quantum computing. So this is when it's really kind of, okay, we understand the risk, this is starting to get urgent. And of course, in between here in 2019, maybe some of you heard that we reached quantum supremacy. So Google announced quantum supremacy, which means they used an actual, a real life quantum computer to solve a problem that a classical computer never could. Even the most powerful, they benchmarked it. Um, There's some debate here, but they benchmarked it against IBM supercomputer. And uh, it would have taken trillions of years for, for that supercomputer to solve what this quantum computer was able to solve in a matter of seconds. Next year, China also announced quantum supremacy saying they could do it a similar problem 10 billion times faster than Google. So international competition heating up, right? And, and a real demonstration of how quantum computing is actually advancing. So in 2021, uh, Department of Home Homeland Security released guidelines for agencies to transition to PQC. And PQC is that idea of post-quantum cryptography. So it's, this, it's, it's a post-RSA world um, and these are the crypto systems that are, are introduced, that we are introducing today. In 2021, and we're starting to kind of get, in the last couple of years, this is really happening, right? There's a bipartisan bill uh, that put $100 billion into R&D, which includes quantum computing and PQC. And then big deal earlier this year, there were two White House memos. And so these were the first, um, in the US, these mandated that all agencies had 100, first 180 days to plan for this transition to post-quantum or quantum resilient cryptography. And then later they got a little more serious in May and said, okay, here's the money, get on this, right? Uh, and in, in June, also the DOE released plans to modernize cybersecurity at scale. Um, and this of course included, included quantum resilience. This led to a push on NIST, and some of you are probably familiar with NIST. It's a, a non-regulatory body, but they set standards for technology. And they've been working on a competition for several, several years now for these post-quantum algorithms or quantum resilient algorithms. And as of July 5th, they released their standards for these. So it is now both mandated and standardized. And so this is really a, a demonstration of how fast this technology is moving and also how important it is that we get ahead of it. And I've included a link at the bottom here, I'll share in the chat. Uh, QSecure was fortunate enough to, to be part of authoring a uh, report that just came out today from the World Economic Forum. And it's a really, really great report on uh, if you want a deeper dive on the quantum threat, as well as what to do about it. And with that, I will turn it over to Aaron Moore to talk about the threat to embedded devices. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, so embedded devices are everywhere. There's billions and billions of them. Uh, how this particular threat manifests against them will, will become, I hope, relatively obvious. Uh, as we talked about earlier, the, the entire chain of trust that we've established in order to actually uh, use the internet between devices is about a 40 year old model, it's public key encryption model using a certificate authority, uh, digital signatures, signed images. Uh, all of those things can be referred to as a PKI tree, right? Embedded devices, because they don't have a lot of processing power, there's very small size, weight, and power uh, envelope for them to operate in. They have to use firmware, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. And we're gonna, that firmware, in order for it to be updated to load a trusted image, has to check digital signatures and this uh, PKI tree with certificate authorities to understand which uh, parts of the software 
have been verified uh, and before it loads it, for instance, uh, because it, as I mentioned, it doesn't, they usually don't have a lot of processing power so that uh, you can't decrypt a lot of things. It's just, it's just not practical for small sensor devices. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Uh, how did I get uh, roped into talking about these? I, I used to write code for SCADA systems, uh, industrial control systems, uh, very familiar with that. Uh, and anyway, so hopefully I'll be able to highlight a few things in there. Also worked at NSA for a number of years uh, uh, for big data exploitation. I was the director for advanced cyber effects at the National Reconnaissance Office and uh, CTO at uh, Northrop Grumman for algorithmic warfare and offensive cyber. So a little bit of background in this. Um, and, and yeah, let's just go ahead and jump in. Next slide. So what I took uh, in order for us to have a better feel for what I'm talking about is your cable modem. I bet 100% of the people on this call have cable modem, Cox, Xfinity, Comcast, what have you. If you have a cable modem, you've got embedded keys. Uh, you've got embedded certificate authorities, root keys. How these keys are managed they're, uh, through that certificate authority PKI tree, they're signed at the manufacturer. There's usually an intermediate certificate uh, authority that then signs the keys for the endpoint devices. Now, a lot of the devices themselves, they can have their keys uh, changed out uh, relatively easily. So an attacker wouldn't necessarily need to go after the keys on the endpoints. Where the targets are, are either the root signing keys uh, and uh, the cryptography there and the intermediate keys. Why the intermediate? Uh, the intermediates usually control between 4,000 and upwards of 150,000 endpoint devices. So there are very, um, very juicy targets for an attacker. And you might say, well, how do they get these keys? Well, it was talked about a little bit earlier with the steel now decrypt later. It's just not the data that's, that's being stolen. It's the entire session. So when you set up a session between your endpoint, your router, and the router up through the cable management termination uh, site, uh, that's all protected using public key cryptography, uh, primarily uh, setting up a TLS 1.3, 1.2, or an SSL connection. That public key cryptography protects the symmetric keys that are embedded in these devices. So DOSIS that, that you see there stands for Data Over Cable Services Interface System. So that's, that's the model that I'm using now, but it's the same model that's used in IoT, other embedded devices, most all firmware, and uh, it's also used in your browser, for instance. And that's a little snapshot of my browser, certificate uh, keys, uh, which say that if I have a, uh, for instance, I have a Google certificate, then sites, that also have that certificate I can interact with and trust, right? So this, this whole internet system that we use is based on that. Now, why that's important to embedded devices is for them to receive their updates. They communicate back through the intermediate and then all the way sometimes to the, uh, the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer for software updates. And that's an SSL channel. So by capturing that entire transmission, you capture the public keys that protect the symmetric keys in, in a lot of cases. And then you, with a quantum computer, you're able to extract both the, pub, the, the private keys for that session. And by being able to do that, you can generate your own copy of that private key. So now I can forge certificates. Very, very problematic as you can imagine. Next slide. 
So on the left, what you see is the normal way in which uh, software updates happen, right? Just like we talked about, there's a root certificate that's signed, there's an intermediate certificate, and then there's the endpoints. So when they communicate back, they're looking for that trusted signed uh, image or file that they're going to update. That can all be all the way down into uh, the, the bootloader software, but it can be any other software that is being run on that device or any firmware. On the right, what you're seeing is how an attacker could exploit this using the quantum uh, capabilities that are out there. They extract the private keys. They already know the public keys. They create their own certificates and then reroute the traffic from those endpoint devices through their certificates and provide updates, whatever updates they really want. And the, guess what? The uh, embedded device is going to accept it because it can't not accept it. It's a signed um, document, it's a signed certificate with all of the necessary cryptographic hashes, et cetera, that allow those devices to then go ahead and accept it and upload it and, uh, and move on with their sensing life. So what does that do? Well, you've compromised the entire, uh, the entire system. <clears throat> it can be compromising your entire browser, compromising all of whatever you do on Netflix or whatever, every subscriber, every bank transaction, uh, car to car uh, trans, um, exchanges, uh, vehicle to vehicle, for instance. So it really absolutely demolishes the uh, PKI tree that we talked about. And how fast can they do this? Uh, Becca taught, touched on it, right? So with a, uh, a 4099 qubit mm, computer, you can inst instantaneously crack RSA. So why, what about RSA? All right, well, it's uh, asymmetric and the RSA key length is 1024 that protects the 256 bit symmetric key that is in, it uses AES. So it's essentially has no protection whatsoever and you can get the symmetric keys, right? And once you've done that, you, you, own, you own everything. You don't really have to do any of these other uh, different types of exploits on, on the system. If I can control the root of trust and the certificate authorities through that PKI tree, I own them. I own them forever, right? And there's over hundreds of billions of devices, uh, which was touched on already. Your smartphones, your computers, your lap, everything. Everything that's on the internet has this type of structure for its own security. Extremely dangerous. Next slide. So what's the impact? We've touched on it before, but we had an, uh, a study done and there's an econometric model that, that says it'll be a $12.8 trillion impact to the economy across a variety of areas. And it's fundamentally the ability for quantum computing to break asymmetric encryption and then replace those roots of trust with forged certificates. All right, well, hopefully that gave you a little bit uh, insight in it. I would, if you're interested to see what you've got on your computer, Go to your terminal, use a curl command. If you don't know what that is, go look it up. It's very easy to use. It'll tell you what you're doing. You can use an nmap command to look at other websites to see what type of uh, algorithms they're running and what TLS levels they've got. And I think you'll be pretty surprised at a lot of things that are out there, how insecure they are, how small of key lengths there are out there still. Heck, there's a lot of industrial processes around the world that are still on Windows 4, for example. So it's a huge vulnerability. Anyway, so I will pass this on and uh, thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, you always scare the heck out of me and I love hearing it. So, uh, you know, we uh, really need to get this, uh, get this problem solved in our world. Um, 
I'm going to talk to you real quick about solutions and preparation, you know, things that can be done today and tomorrow as we as we prepare for quantum day, whenever it does surprise us, we know it'll be a surprise. We hope it's a little bit longer, but it's likely to come in the next one to three years. So, um, Pat, could I have the next slide, please? So let's talk about how to get it, how to get this uh, this problem taken care of. The first order uh, we see as being really critical is you've got to follow a system approach. This means not just trying to fix one element of the quantum problem, but fixing the quantum problem in, in, in its entirety. You know, this is the uh, equivalent in networking to uh, you're not safe until you've connect, protected all of your connections. You can't just protect, you know, the basic system. You know, this is why you find out that most of the hacks that are successful occur because of, say, for instance, a phishing attack on a vendor who happened to have access into your network in some way, and then they were able to privilege escalate and, and walk through the, uh, the attack chain. Um, you know, this is the same same kind of thing for for quantum. It needs to be handled across all this all the ecosystem. That prevents a uh, presents a really tough set of problems. Um, we are not used to upgrading everything at once. And when you consider the embedded world, uh, some devices that are too small to run cryptography uh, or or to be updated, some devices that are locked down, no matter how big or or small their uh, capabilities are. Um, and then we also have in crazy, but we have embedded devices that are that are approximately as powerful as the the best you know laptops, desktops, you know that are getting into server strength um, simply because of the acceleration of of capabilities in the uh, in the microprocessor and uh, power power uh, power versus uh, compute versus power benefits that have occurred in you know in the embedded world over the last uh, decade or so. So you'll find it it's a very very broad and difficult problem. Um, so the system level approach is really important. Um, it's also very important to have validated solutions. These are, this essentially means that um, you're following algorithms have been time tested. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in the Q&A. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, the history of algorithms is that algorithms fail periodically. NIST has gone through a long process to, to come up with these that are the recommendations for the U.S. We're going to see other countries do the same thing. It's all on an international effectively competition, competition being between the algorithms and with the attackers. The attackers, the international scientific community um, is destroying al algorithms on a very regular basis, well, um, proving them to be uh, to be uh, readily uh, broken. You know, some, like some of the attacks occurred in less than hours. Um, so uh, this is for the new post-quantum algorithms. Uh, every one of these algorithms has a trick to it that if you know the trick uh, in your algorithmic, you know, in your computation, you're able to find the result very quickly. These are not secrets, they're tricks. Um, if you don't know the trick, you have an infinite amount of search time. And that is the uh, that is essentially how, how cryptography uh, works for us. Um, so we, we uh, believe that the, the important thing is to use validated because if you've got proprietary, you just don't know how well it's gonna be standing up. Um, Easily adopted is a really critical part. This is a tough deployment problem because you're trying to handle so many devices. So you need something that can be uh, deployed readily, quickly across the uh, across the ecosystem. Uh, you also need really essentially simplicity, small changes in your systems. Uh, the reason is is that you can't uh, you can't go through big hardware and software upgrades. You can't have high risk changes. You got to be able to push them in quickly. Um, figure out how they how they work and validate them, and then and then spread broadly. So, um, minimally disruptive and smallest amount of code change possible is a big goal. Um, staged upgrade is really critical as well. You need to be able to upgrade critical elements of your of your network and your ecosystem first, and then be able to start going out more towards edge components or those that 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 have some compensating controls in place. Um, you know, essentially, uh, edge nodes typically fall in the in the later in the later camp. While some of the uh, uh, data processing and filtering functions are going to be be a higher priority, um, and then uh, you really have to do end to end. I think I covered that in the system approach. Um, finally, resilient to attack is critical. We are going to see quantum is going to enable uh, a whole new uh, world of attack generation. You know, the creation of new attacks. We've seen a lot of that happen in the endpoint space as. Um, people have understood better the vulnerabilities that are in generic computer science, you know, and the standard practices of building software. 
uh, quantum computing brings the power of an incredible optimizer and correlator, um, you know, through through the through the uh, power of being able to compute everything at once. So we're going to find out that the attack the attack count and the the uh, new style of attack uh, it's going to enable a, a, an enormous number of of, uh, of successful exploits. So uh, Pat, let me have the next slide. So so let's talk about what we think gets you there. Um, clearly, solutions that are based on standards, based on uh, validated algorithms. Um, and the other part is that you really need keys. Um, the key generation that occurs in CMOS, um, CMOS is very good at digital. It's very rotten at analog. That's why we love using it in, in uh, silicon. Um, keys generated by uh, non-random CMOS generally are predictable. Um, there are quite a few attacks out there. Um, so, so really, it's difficult to create um, those keys and add enough randomness to them um, from typical CMOS, including doing you know real world sampling. Um, you really want to get down to the quantum level. And so, um, in the solution we're delivering, we we're working uh, standards based, um, another and and with a, uh, a qualified uh, post you know quantum it's uh, quantum key source, which is essentially a unconstrained quantum computer. Um, this is a validated, you know, uh, standard off-the-shelf product, um, but, but quite expensive. So we 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 create we uh, deploy that and deliver it into into your network, so that you end up with keys that are of, of high quality. Um, the next step is you really need easy deployment and backwards compatibility. So uh, software-only upgrade allows you to be upgrading all platforms. Um, there, of course, is is porting to go to the IoT embedded system operating systems. Um, there are protocols that need to be ported to. These are got a protocol. We've got a uh, uh, capability that'll support lots of communications protocols, including down into data burst messaging protocols. You know, so you've got short numbers of, of uh, bits in the message. You know, small numbers of bits in the message and infrequent messaging, um, all the way to you know standard IP uh, protocols. But um, dealing with things like Automotive, embedded automotive, embedded aer aeronautical uh, satellite as well, as well as the um, industrial control and SCADA systems. So um, the, we see that these are critical in terms of getting uh, small, uh, easy software upgrades, good keys and, and, uh, and the algorithms. The, from a system level, policy-driven crypto agility is essential. Crypto agility gives you the ability to switch out and change algorithms, gives you the ability to uh, manage when you have an attack or the destruction of an algorithm, you know, like has been published on many of the NIST algorithms of late uh, that are post-quantum candidates. Uh, if you look back in the history of, of cryptography, uh, you'll find out that we thought DES was a great algorithm and then that was broken. And then we went to triple DES and that was broken and we went to AES. Uh, Rendall, um, that was uh, that is that is survived to this point, except quantum computing weakens it. So you have to go to a longer key length. Um, we have seen the quantum attack. Uh, Shor's algorithm prove that the public key, a lot of our modern our current public key is is highly vulnerable and will be broken in in the order of seconds with uh, quantum computing. Um, and then uh, you'll see uh, you've seen that that algorithms have uh, that that are candidates for post quantum were broken. So uh, we expect that the algorithms will continue to fall. Uh, accordingly, you need to be able to push out new algorithms very rapidly. You need to be able to take measures to minimize the risk in a system of any one algorithm being compromised that you don't know yet, because uh, as a nation state uh, attacker you know, proves an algorithm is and, and, and you know, creates a, uh, an approach that invalidates an algorithm, it probably won't become public until uh, as long as they can hold it secret, they will hold it secret. Um, it's because it gives them an advantage. So when that does happen, you need to be able to figure out ways to uh, deliver as much flexibility and breadth in algorithm usage as possible. So that if you uh, if you do happen to have one algorithm that's compromised, you don't lose your system. Um, we've, we've got capability to do that in the, in the solution we offer. Um, the policy is very important because you need to be able to use policy to uh, select which uh, elements in your network are upgraded first when they are not, uh, you need to be able to control when they are not able to downgrade to uh, the previous the previous solution, the pre-quantum or the uh, failed algorithm. 
and you also need to be able to audit uh that way you know which machines to go tackle which ones to go upgrade first so or upgrade next so that's a critical function really this is putting a control plane into cryptography we do not have that in our current public key model with uh, tls um last but not least um we think it's very important to be detecting attack and then deploying countermeasures and providing active defense so uh as as you you would like to know in your cryptography operations if there you're in an environment where you're being actively attacked and that active attack could happen on one link or it could happen across your across your ecosystem the idea being if if you're under attack you can start to if you can and you can detect it you can start to take measures some of those measures may, may be to abbreviate your operations they may be to uh uh reauthenticate force reauthentication of systems it may be to bump the rate of uh protections against side channels such as you know rotating keys or or other 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 type cryptographic improvements you may decide to rotate algorithms um the idea being that you need uh you need to be able to be flexible you'd also like to have uh countermeasures that um can can you know be deployed at endpoints to increase the capability of of protection so so these you know some are system level configurations some are countermeasures you can deploy on a on a specific endpoint um be that a server or an edge device or whatever else so so these these are the foundations of the solution uh that we are offering uh the goal is to try to trust nothing you know really follow zero trust architectural principles um, really uh, targeting we're targeting data in motion first because of the public key risk uh, that is well understood mm -hmm. for the first quantum computing attacks that are that are well known these are essentially shores um, we expect that to go uh, over to symmetric key algorithm quite soon and um, that's the, uh, the the gist of it is to really get that integrated easily and quickly across your networks uh, I think we're to Q and A. Pat, is that the next? Or Brandon, is that the? Yes, we are. So thanks very much, folks. Um, Skip, hand it to you. Yep. Thank you, Greg. Thanks to this amazing team. Hopefully, this was very informative. We have a bunch of questions now, so we're going to go through these, um, and then I would ask uh, for those that are answering the questions, try to keep your response to about a minute or less if you can. Um, and by the way, again, if any of you need us to contact you or go further into these. Uh, just drop your email address in um, in uh, uh, the Q and A area, and we will contact you directly. So let's jump in. There are two questions on um, these NIST algorithms getting defeated, uh, and is this not discouraging? So I know there's one from Philip, one from James. Greg, you want to kick that off, and then Aaron, you back him up on that. Sure. Um, you know, I tried to. Uh, I saw Philip's question before I got to speak. So. Um, I, uh, I'll tell you, I mean, I, I said it a moment ago, we're going to see algorithms fall fast. And I think uh, that's just the nature of where we are. We see software fall fast in the endpoint protection market, you know, so endpoint monitoring and protection has become a huge business. And it's because people write bugs into software. Algorithms may not have bugs in them. It just may be that the trick is able to be, you know, the computational trick that makes them uh, irreversible or gives them, you know, that essentially what cryptography is, um, may be able to be worked through so that uh, in that case, you know, when when somebody comes up with an innovative approach, uh, luck, luckily most of those are coming out of academia, so they're getting published, but when they do, we will see the algorithms fall. Um, and the, the, the attacks are typically focused on one algorithm or one style of algorithms. For instance, uh, 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 the, uh, um, you, you could do it on the public key that are based on computation of prime number stuff. Uh, you could also do it on lattice, you know, the post, a lot of post quantum algorithms that are public key are based on lattice, uh, lattice computations and the lattice computations are essentially a big search. Um, so if you can accelerate that search, you've, you've got a crack. Um, I don't think it's really that big of a surprise. I think we're going to see acceleration. I mean, honestly, based on the history, we are used to algorithms falling. So let's just get used to that and and create the tools that enable us to get there. Um, that does cause problems uh, specifically in the fact that a lot of these things are buried deeply in the embedded space, um, whether they're in hardware or in software that can't be upgraded. Uh, at least in the traditional view. So we're working to make sure to deliver rapid, easy, uh, easily integratable uh, solutions to, to take these systems to, uh, to safe. 
Aaron, Thanks, you Greg, add? Aaron, uh, would you want to add to that? Yeah, it's just not uh, not just the algorithms themselves. We need the crypto agility across the protocols. So the implementation of the protocols, if you look at how TLS 1.3, it took about uh, 10 years and 28 revisions to the IETF RFC 8446 on how that particular protocol was implemented. And that uh, was over the experience of poodle attacks and a variety of other attacks that forced the systems communicating into lower and lower uh, cryptologic algorithm security levels. So you have to look at both the implementation and, and the algorithms and provide with the agility to move rapidly between them as the attackers uh, attempt to degrade your, your um, security profile. Thank you, Greg and Aaron. Um, Manas asked if we're going to make the presentation available. We will. Uh, all of you will get a link to our website. We'll post it up there so you'll have that, uh, that capability. James, some great comments in there. I see those. Um, and uh, we will get in contact with you. Um, uh, now, this one looks like um, for John. John uh, Drew said, how does your product, uh, pro how do your products implement zero trust architecture? So Greg, maybe you can help on that. But what is the approach? And maybe John just hit that zero trust side again. And Greg, you, you can talk about how we're working there. Well, I mean, the key component of zero trust is why are we doing this? Well, we're doing it to protect data. Uh, so the definition of zero trust is it's a strategy to prevent data breaches and stop other cybersecurity attacks from being uh, successful. So when you put it in the context of data, anything that I can do to protect data is part of a zero trust strategy, right? So th this is why uh, I've always focused also on uh, encryption and other kinds of things in my research, because it's not just, you know, th there's no easy button to this stuff. These are really complex attacks, complex attackers. But on, on the other side, we got really smart people. Like I mentioned, when I started, I had lunch with Whit Diffie. I mean, one of the key, com key things is some guy that no one had ever heard of invented, uh, you know, putting two prime numbers to get multiplying two prime numbers together that in, in, in help create this Diffie algorithm, uh, Diffie Hel Hellman uh, algorithm that, you know, is the basis for a lot of what we do. So I'm never worried that, you know, somebody's breaking something today because I know that that when that happens, it makes things better. And all this stuff is about protecting the data that we use, protecting our privacy, making our lives better. Yep. And I think, um, John, thank you for that. I think I think the key that we're trying to do is make sure that we are not counting on anything else in the system to be trusted in order to be able to deliver the cryptography. Um, we do, you know, we work to to monitor our software for, for penetration so that if you've got a penetrated endpoint, we hopefully can detect it when they come try to break cryptography. You know, you may end up with, you know, the, so it's, it's to try to minimize the cross section of what you count on what where the uh, trust is in that system and that is that is the uh you know that's the the principle of you know as john pointed out of what he's what he's uh built in in zta so great thanks greg thanks john aaron this is for you um could you please share your visionary approach to securing space system assets with few secure products this is from drew Yeah, so uh, everybody probably know, you know, a satellite is nothing more than a, a flying transmitter receiver with some uh, sensors on it, some payloads, uh, and it's out there by itself, right? So a lot of what goes on on a satellite, and I've had a number of satellite programs. I was a DARPA program manager for um, satellites. I was at uh, NRO, Advanced Systems Technology. So I have a number of flying vehicles up there. Uh, very familiar with this space. I've also worked offensive uh, space control, defensive space control, if you know those terms. So on board the satellite, you've got subsystems like guidance, navigation control, attitude, uh, thermal, power, all these various things. And a lot of housekeeping goes on with the mission computer. Uh, that information passes across a bus. Uh, it's, it's an older architecture, so uh, a lot of these space systems um, don't have, weren't built um, to be secure inside themselves. But recently, with new types of payloads, new types of sensors, onboard processing, a lot of the, um, 
a lot of interaction is now happening across that data bus. What we believe is we need to secure the intra-satellite communications between the subsystems and those payloads and sensors so that you don't have rogue sensors or payloads on board the system that can take your system down. And we talked a little bit about the, the firmware updates uh, that go on with embedded systems. And in fact, uh, almost the entire satellite is an embedded system or has throughout it are embedded systems. And for them to change the image of their processing software, they rely on the digital certificates and the PKI infrastructure. There's a lot of symmetric keys, don't get me wrong, uh, protecting the comms links, uh, protecting the data in, in a lot of cases. But usually the data and communications across the, the bus on the vehicle are completely open. Not a good situation in today's modern world. So we believe we can cryptologically isolate with post-quantum uh, encryption the components within the satellite itself on orbit. Now you get down to the ground station and you look at how a ground station is configured and you look at my background. I was the chief engineer at uh, Menwith Hill, which is the largest uh, ground satellite site, intelligence collection site in the world. Uh, I had all that. And uh, the ground sites are divided into a variety of mission centers, ops centers, uh, you name it. And the communications across the buses within the ground sites need to be isolated as well. And between the um, components that manage, for instance, the power, where my radars are, or antennas are pointing, all of those various things uh, require uh, protection of embedded systems. And then, of course, between the ground site and another ground site to exchange data uh, as the satellite goes around the globe, that's another uh, link that needs that post-quantum encryption because we still rely on PKI throughout. And it doesn't matter if it's the intelligence community, DOD, or commercial, PKI is, and, and the uh, PKI tree that I kind of touched on is the, uh, the model for security for all of these communications. So we see a lot of our capabilities being able to uh, prevent the problems that uh, quantum post-quantum computing uh, will present to the space enterprise. Great, thank you, Aaron. Thanks, Greg. Uh, hey, Pete, uh, I'd like you to come on screen if you can, because uh, uh, I got a question here and I'd like you to, to address. Yep, oh, Greg, I'm sorry, do you have something else? Can I, can I tag and get Pete on here? Uh, can I tack on Dave Bennett's question about- Yeah, I, I've got one right ahead of that, Greg. I got oh. one right ahead, hold on. Um, yeah, I wanna, I wanna get this question out. Yeah. Um, this Lee asked two questions. One was about um, how do we get the 4,099 qubit number? That was from Shor's algorithm. Uh, but the more important question is, when do we expect the industry to get there? And I think what Lee's talking about is when do we expect a quantum computer to have enough power to hack? And the reason I brought Pete on, he heads up our federal operations. And I think it's important to know that it's not all about just brute forcing with 4,099. And Pete, maybe you can allude to a couple other methodologies that could be being used out there to create quantum computers that uh, can be built faster than getting to that strict number. Yeah, I love it. And a great question. And I love to watch uh, brilliant people in action. I'm sorry, I was uh, behind the scenes here with a name like Shadow, you gotta stay quiet. Uh, there's a uh, Shores algorithm side that we're most familiar with. That's where the 4099 comes in and those need to be coherent. Uh, fault tolerant quantum computer or what the national security memorandum number eight and 10 both call CRQC, cryptanically relevant quantum computers. They're gonna chunk through that non-polynomial hard math and eat, basically eat the apple all in one bite. But there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes with noisy intermediate scale quantum computing and heuristic algorithms like variational quantum factoring that really do binary optimizations and they are mixing hybrid compiling. And what they'll basically do is use the expertise of what we know is classical computing right now with those noisy intermediate scale quantum computers that we have prior to getting a full fault tolerant quantum computer or cryptanically relevant quantum computer. And they measure those uh, trade-offs between uh, coherency and solution architecture and binary optimization depth. 
that lets us take certain pieces, break them, save them, recompile, and, and in essence, eat the apple bites at a time. So that's heavy going on right now. There's lots of great articles out there and lots of academia leaning into it. So that is the question of the day. When is a noisy intermediate scale quantum computing capability that mixes with classical quantum computing capability going to be able to break the asymmetric keys? And that is going to define Q day. And I think it's going to sneak up on us like a, a thief in the night. And then Dave, great to see you here, even though we don't see a great question on the QSL and the uh, integration across how we would organizationally put this into federal spaces and PKIs, et cetera. A lot of new things coming out of federal spaces, not just for defense, but across all federal spaces. We do have some capability on that. Love to talk to you offline and we'll give you some of the details on what we're doing because at QSecure, we're not interested in just meeting one problem. We're, we're trying to meet proxy to proxy, the full services across the internet of things like Aaron talked about, all the way down to PKI, because it's not just a defense, it's a, it's a commercial and a federal integrated thing that the threat's looking at. So great question, brother, good to see you. Yep, Greg jumped in on that. Actually, Pete nailed it, um, you know, but we are absolutely getting into it with PKI, uh, bringing post-quantum to it in creative ways, not just, not just going in there and trying to handle the uh, the straightforward upgrade, but actually trying to bring in visibility and capability there. Uh, and and yes, engaging, engaging as Pete pointed out, you know, NSA, DISA, and, and getting to uh, rapid adoption in USG, so. I think Great. the only thing, the only thing that I would add to that, Greg, if, I, if, if we were talking is our phase three, CIBR lets us work across 12 different agencies in the government, not just DOD, but numbers of others. And, and really uh, do it with any color of money and rapidly. You know, the POM has a lot of things driving uh, uh, S&T and R&D dollars. But if you want the application space that's backwards compatible without a manufacturing readiness level that's low, let us come out there and try to see what we can do to meet some of these needs before the threat passes. Great, and uh, we are at time, but we'll keep going on questions. I would say again, if, if you have more questions or you feel your question may not get answered or you have to go, just drop your email at the bottom and we will contact you. Um, and on as a question, it is, I'd like Greg and Aaron to jump in on this one. Um, are NIST PQC algorithms working well on IoT devices? If not, uh, what is the best IoT simulator or uh, what can be used for testing standard PQC algorithms? Yep. Um, they're they're not computationally complex um, any worse than doing current current algorithms. Um, we've we, you know they there are some candidates that are uh, and this did not select that were computationally onerous, um, but I'll tell you you can you can run these on on just about anything save the dumbest uh, battery constrained you know like the little tiny uh, sensor that needs to last ten years on a on a double A cell. Those are going to have a little bit of a hard time. They typically have a hard time running cryptography at all. But, um, you know, pretty much any, even on a small pick, you can run these things. So uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't fuss too much about that. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. If it's running cryptography today, it should be able to run crypto. It should be able to run post-quantum. And we're working on uh, X509 uh, extensions for uh, post-quantum uh, cryptography so that the certificate authorities can be updated as well. Great, a couple more questions here. Jordan asked uh, about IBM's thousand qubit system claim in 2023. Uh, we see other claims as well, that's true. You got Cyclonum, Rigetti, uh, of course, Google's out there as well. Uh, is 2025 a realistic target date for 50K, 100K qubit? Becca, that's all yours. Yeah, I was just, uh, I was just taking a look at this one. Um, yeah, as Skip said, um, I'll post a couple of links, but there are a number of companies working on different architectures. Um, for example, ion trapping, uh, and, and these have different advantages. Um, so their superconducting is most popular because we have a lot of infrastructure that backs that up. Ion trapping is uh, you need fewer physical qubits, et cetera. Um, there, there are a number of different uh, roadmaps and estimates, but I will say that um, the CEO of Google, I think a couple of years ago now, said that it's going to be five to 10 years when we have that, that error-corrected 4,000 qubit quantum computer. So, um, so I think it's, it's realistic. Great. Uh, one last question. Let's talk cryptocurrency here. This has come around on a couple of different questions. Um, Aaron, uh, why don't you give us your thoughts on is crypto hackable by quantum and why? 
uh, maybe in the areas of vulnerability? Yeah, sure. I, I tried to type a little bit on that. So the digital signature algorithms are the, uh, the Achilles heel to the blockchain and uh, the smart contract systems. It all depends on that. It's uh, elliptic curve, Diffie Hellman. Uh, those can be easily broken and then forged, similar to uh, like we talked about with the certificate authorities. As well, the uh, private keys can be extracted. The Ethereum uses a persistent public key that's published on the blockchain that can be easily uh, gotten uh, with a blockchain explorer. And then the quantum could uh, theoretically extract the private key. And then they, guess what? They own your wallet. The other thing is on older uh, Bitcoin wallets, uh, when they initially put them out, they did not have any types not very strong encryption uh, concerns, right? It was a project. Uh, so a lot of the older Bitcoin wallets are very vulnerable. And if they have tokens in them, guess what? They're in those, you own those keys, you own those tokens. The other thing on Bitcoin is while it does rotate its public keys uh, more often than Ethereum, for instance, uh, it, it is conceivable that if there is a uh, quantum hacking computer, that during the transaction process requests, when there's a transaction pool and you have the miners drawing from it, that a forged transaction could be put forward in the transaction pool with perhaps using uh, you know, a little bit more priority, paying a little bit more for that miner to include that particular transaction in a block. And then that, uh, that hack essentially gets in front of the legitimate transaction request from the, the token holder. And then of course those tokens are, are expended the way that the, uh, the hacker intends. So there are a couple different ways. Uh, while the algorithms, the SHA-256 are still post-quantum secure, the, uh, the digital signatures and the way that the uh, transactions are, are held or handled by the miners in block construction uh, open are open avenues to exploitation. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks to everybody. We appreciate all that have attended here. Thank you so much. We'll make this available online uh, here in a few days. Thanks to all of our great presenters, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks from Q Secure. Have a great day. Thanks a lot.